be for instance. So this I will leave off. And right now I would like to talk not in detail about the sources of law for mediation, just to show you, if you want to know more, you can read the article of Knut Benjamin Pisler. But I, don't, I just want to show you a general issue, which I already <coughs> mentioned at the beginning. So there exist, of course, laws and regulations, political guidelines and so on about mediation in China. But then, as you see here, these People's Mediations Regulations of 89 stipulate, for instance, if there exists no laws or regulations to decide on a certain issue, a decision also can be made on the basis of societal morality. So this is not actually not um, imaginable in German law, as I just uh, told you at the beginning, because we have this uh, strict separation of law and morality, this thesis of separation. And there is another law or another regulation, the People's Mediations, People's Mediation Employment Regulations. They stipulate that a decision can be made on the basis of a socialist of the socialist morality. So once more, a mix-up of morality and law in today's China which is written into a law. So right now I would like to show you the advantages of mediation. They are cheaper, faster, and more to the point than a procedural dispute resolution. But nevertheless, there exists a disadvantage. Actually, it's not a disadvantage, but I've named it here a disadvantage. And that is that mediation, mediation is generally more applicable only for certain legal fields, especially civil law, mean for an economic law, also labor law but less applicable for other laws, like especially criminal law. So with respect to environmental law, we can say that it depends on the legal field, which is uh, the concrete case. Okay, so right now, <laughs> after this general part of about mediation, I would like to talk about mediation in environmental law. And um, to quote uh, another uh, writer in this field, I would like to quote Gauthier, as he has only recently written an article about green cards in China. And she says that, according, citation, according to an interview conducted on January 2010, so very current data, and this is very striking actually, data for the period November 2007 to November 2009 indicate that 69 of civil cases in environmental law were handled through mediation. So here you see that a quite high number of mediation uh, with respect to civil environment disputes exists and that the majority of civil disputes are settled through mediation. With respect to administrative environmental disputes, I would like to quote Stephanie Fire. she says, citation, in practice the majority of administrative disputes are settled through mediation by environmental protection bureaus. So these are these bureaus I showed you in this uh, figure. So we also can say that the majority of administrative disputes are settled through mediation. So you see mediation is very important. So nevertheless, there exists, at least that's my impression, a research gap about mediation in environmental law enforcement. You can find more literature about green courts, about environmental courts, but not so many uh, pieces of literature about mediation in environmental law. And another issue is also the lack of judicial statistics. Okay, so right now I would like to talk about courts. And yes, just look at this um, court structure here. This is um, the general court structure in China. We have at the top a Supreme Court, then we have certain local courts. Uh, High courts, intermediate courts, and basic courts. High courts are at the province level, intermediate courts at the district level, and basic courts at the county level. And then we have also special courts like military courts, sea courts, railway courts, and so on. Okay, just, I think some of you already know this, just to repeat it. Another important issue before I talk about environmental courts are the system of two instances. So in Chinese law, they a citizen can only go through two instances, first instance Yishan, and second instance Arshan. So this is also called the system of two instances with the second as the last instance, Liangshan, Zhongshan, Zhu. Okay. And right now, 
let's talk about courts in environmental law. Of course, a regular course, the normal course in China can accept environmental cases, but they are nevertheless often reluctant. And then Recently, we see the involvement of so-called green courts, as Gautier writes, and these are special environmental courts, and right now I would like to tell you more about that. Uh, we have this article of Gautier, she's a staff from the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, and also an article of Stanley Lubman, he's quite famous, uh, quite famous writer in this field, he is a lawyer and he has an expert in Chinese law. And in this article, we read about the establishment of 11 specialized environmental um, courts in the provinces of Guizhou, Jiangsu, and Yunnan between 2007 and 2009 on an experimental basis once more. So you see once more um, this issue of experimenting. Shixing. And these courts have two different court structures. So there are courts that integrate four types of cases, uh, civil, criminal, and administrative cases, and also uh, enforcement, also Gerichtsvorstreckung. And courts that integrate three types of cases, leaving out this enforcement aspect. And uh, the reason for the establishment of these courts, courts were environmental pollution incidents. So by the way, this is also general logic of law that first uh, concrete situation evolves, uh, that new circumstances evolve, and then the law tries to govern it somehow and tries to enforce the laws. Okay, here you see a table of this article of Gautier, uh, which is res with respect to the establishment and operation of environmental courts in China. I s can you read it? Yes, it's big enough. Okay. So, um, it's about the environmental courts, here you see these courts and the date of establishment, total number of cases. And then the main types of cases, you see that in every case, over 50% of cases are criminal cases. And then also public interest cases, this is another um, research focus in Chinese law, also in Chinese environmental law, and then some rules also. Okay, so right now I would like to talk about the main focus of this lecture, and that is legal ed and the wage chain and rights defense movement. So wage chain is a movement that started in 2003 with the outbreak of SARS. At that time, the people wanted to know what is going on in China, because the Chinese government at that time uh, was very reluctant to open up its information about SARS. So this issue of uh, the right to know, Zhu Jingquan, became a uh, quite often seen issue in the newspapers and in the literature. And another issue um, which uh, led to the outbreak of this, uh, to the start of this wage earn movement, is the so-called Sun Gang incident, which led to the custody and, uh, which led to the abolishment of the custody and repatriation system. <laughs> I cannot go more into detail about it. If you want to know more, you can read articles of Eva Pilz, Thomas Kellogg, or others. And it's quite uh, uh, good. It's, um, it's uh, an issue which you can find uh, quite often in the literature. So, just to give a definition once more, the wage earn movement includes lawyers, activists, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens who aim to push the boundaries of reform by using China's existing laws and courts to defend human rights.